Hello, everybody. It is Thursday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, Assistant Sports Editor for Multimedia at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Back for our weekly Zeiss is Right video with Paul Zeiss, Post-Gazette Sports Columnist. How are you, Paul? Uh, I've had better days, but I'll power through it, that's for sure. We are going to get into some Steelers quarterback talk. Um, Dak Prescott is apparently going to play his uh, the 2024 season on an expiring contract. If things don't work out with Russell Wilson and Justin Fields, could he be an option for the Steelers come next offseason? Um, get into a little bit of some of these other moves the Steelers have made or, or not made. Legereus Sneed goes to Tennessee in a trade. That's a name that was connected to the Steelers a fair amount. Going to get Paul's thoughts on that. And, of course, it is Pirates opening day, so me and Paul are, always love to talk a little baseball. Before we get into all of that, just want to thank our primary sponsor for this episode of the podcast, Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. There's no better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella, who can help you save on energy costs year-round. Schedule a free in-home consultation with your local Pella Windows and Doors to find the right product for your home and budget. Give them a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project further. That's 866-593-1560 to get started planning on your new windows and doors installation with Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. Um, Paul, I set it up at the top of the show. Dak Prescott looks like he is going to be available in next season's free agent class. Rich Eisen, um, famously of NFL Network, uh, one of their big pundits, said he can imagine Dak Prescott coming to the Steelers. He'd be 32 years old. Um, do you think that if things don't work out with Russell Wilson and 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 Russell, uh, excuse me, Justin Fields, that that's a move you could imagine the Steelers making, given that they've kind of gone out of their comfort zone already this offseason? Um, that would be a lot of money. I mean, I'm assuming they're going to have to pay him what 40 million, probably 45 million, whatever the going rate is. That's a lot of money for a quarterback. Um, I, I mean, I suppose if they, if it doesn't work out for them this year, that's what they could possibly do because they don't, they, they don't owe Russell Wilson anything and Justin Fields, they can easily get out from underneath if by just not, uh, picking up his option. So, uh, to me, they're, they're going to have to do something next year. And if Dak Prescott's available, they would be foolish not to at least look into what it would take to get him here. I don't know if it would, you know, if they get all the way across the finish line, but they certainly would have to kick the tires on that. What's the threshold of success that you think the combination, whether it's one or the other, Russell Wilson, Justin Fields has to have for us not to be talking about Dak Prescott or any other quarterback um, in 2025 and the Steelers extending one or both of those guys um, with the quarterback room that they have? I mean, I would think, obviously, I mean, the, the, the big picture is win a playoff game. I mean, that's the, that's the big picture of how you make a, a progress from last year. The smaller picture, I would think that Russell Wilson would have to have a reasonably good season. I don't know, 28, 29 touchdowns, you know, 10, 11 interceptions, a little bit better than he was last year. Throw for, you know, 3,500, 3,800 yards, something like that. But the biggest thing is winning. You know, he could have a huge season, but if they don't win, then I think that that would be the, the, the you know, the thing what they, they would look at and say, well, it didn't work the way we wanted it to work. So I think they have to win, and I think Russell, Russell Wilson has to be pretty good. Um, the other part of it is I could foresee a situation where at some point if Russell Wilson isn't very good, Justin Fields gets gets promoted to be the starter. Uh, and if he gets promoted to be the starter and he shows any signs that he might actually be any uh, any good, I think he'll be the quarterback of the Steelers in 2025. Yeah, and, and I think uh, Jerry Dulac led into that in his reporting today pretty well, um, suggesting that it's high on the order of business uh, for the Steelers to potentially get Justin Fields signed for 2025. Obviously, the Steelers would have the ability to exercise the fifth-year option but that's probably kind of a prove it situation and they don't get that chance. They have to make that decision, um, I believe on May 2nd. So um, would you, would you favor them giving him a cheaper um, deal for 2025, maybe a one year extension so that they have him under contract and, and they would still have pretty much every other option available to them, but they have him, you know, in the fold and, and one guy, you know, going into 2025. Um, I, I don't know that he would do that, but I think, I would be okay with him giving him actually a two-year extension for, you know, not, you know, see if you can get him to, to sign two years, 24 million, something like that, 12, 13 million a year. I, I could live with something like that if you were going to, because to me, it makes no sense to bring him here if you're not going to have him for a couple of years. It makes no sense to bring him here if he's a backup for the entire season. What was the point of bringing him here? 
Um, so to me, I, I think you, you give him, you, you find a way to give him another year or two so that <clears throat> at the end of this year, you can make some decisions about Russell Wilson based on how he played and know that you've got your guy in place for 2025 or whatever. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't mind. I, I actually would hope that that's what they're trying to do, uh, is avoid paying him his, his, uh, fifth year option while also making sure that they keep him in the, in the fold. Um, it's just, a, I mean, Omar Khan is a, is a, is a pretty good negotiator like that. He's pretty good at making deals and, 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 and things. So hopefully he can do that. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see to what degree Justin Fields wants to bet on himself um, and say, maybe I just want to get to free agency, you know, regardless of whether I start for the Steelers at all this year and, and see what the market would be. But then again, I mean, there's a reason the Steelers were able to get him for a conditional sixth round pick. You would think that, that if they offered him that amount of money, Paul, that, um, you know, that would be pretty enticing, especially if there was some level of guarantee to it. Um, let's get into this Legereus Sneed situation. He ends up going to Tennessee, I believe it was a third and a seventh round pick, and then gets a substantial contract yeah. extension. I think it was in the neighborhood of $80 million over four years. Um, a lot of people wanted to see him in black and gold with the Steelers, thought he was um, a great option. I think if you look at the trade price, it really wasn't that much. But do you just look at that big contract, Paul, and say – there's too many corners available in this this upcoming draft for the Steelers to add another big contract to this defense like that. Yeah, there's no way that I, I would not have been in favor of them giving him that kind of deal. And 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 apparently the Chiefs understood that whoever he they traded him to was going to have to sign him. Um, and and that was I think part of the part of the conditions of why certain teams were basically uh, not even going to be considered. Uh, that, that to me is a lot of money to play, pay a corner. And I know the corner is a really, really important position. I also know it's a position that you can draft for and get guys that are ready to play early in their career for, for a lot less money than that. It's not a position that I would put that much money into unless you have a situation where you got Joey Porter, you drafted him, you developed him. He's played four years, you know, on his rookie contract and he's earned, you know, the fact that, Hey, in this defense, the way they play, okay, this is a guy we've developed. Yeah, we're going to give him the money. But in terms of plugging and playing, we've seen enough evidence that you can go out and get corners in the draft um, that or, or sign corners for a lot less money than that who can be effective players, especially when you already have your, you know, your quote-unquote number one corner in place. Josh Reynolds is another name that's been connected to the Steelers at various points, Paul. He goes to Denver on a two-year deal. Um, the, the the crop of guys that the Steelers can bring in via free agency is, is starting to dwindle. Do you think that puts pressure on this long rumored deal with with Tyler Boyd to get done to bolster the depth of that quarterback room or wide receivers room? Then maybe you add a guy in the draft and and you have you know a solid three with Calvin Austin maybe slotting in around a four. Quez Watkins is in in the mix now. Um, what's your level of interest in in getting this Tyler Boyd deal done sooner than later? Well, the longer it goes on, the more I'm interested in getting it done. I mean, you know, at some point you've got to, get, you know, make that room, make that position better. And I think that Quez Watkins is what he is. You know, he runs fast, but I don't know he's a great receiver. Uh, what's the other guy's name? Van. Van Jefferson. Van Jefferson. I mean, he's he's depth. Calvin Austin is a training camp hero. We've seen no evidence that he's a you know Sunday on on Sundays kind of a really good player. I mean, you basically have George Pickens still. We're still in the same position that you were. Um, and so you got to do something. And I don't think bringing Tyler Boyd in helps in, in, the, in the way that they need help. It'd be another depth piece. So, yeah, okay, go get him. That's great. He, you know, he gives you another depth piece. You still have to find a legitimate number two receiver, which means as this goes forward, it, it now becomes your first round pick is probably going to have to be a receiver. Yeah, a lot of people are talking about tackle too, Paul. Um, I'm I'm more in the receiver group with you. I, I think you need to have those weapons. I think, you know, the threat of the pass has to be credible for the running game to work. We can talk about how Arthur Smith, you know, prefers the running game, all that. But, you know, if, if you, the people don't believe in your passing game, it becomes a lot harder to run. So I, I think you have to add someone. I wouldn't mind seeing that first round pick used on a receiver. Um, but we'll see. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people agree with us, Paul. Um, you and I are always banging on the receiver door on this show, so we'll see how that shakes out. We're going to get into the Pirates here uh, now. 
Uh, before we do, want to thank another sponsor, Pitt Johnstown. It's a Pitt quality education with up close and personal learning, a top ranked Northeast public college by U.S. News and World Report. Generous scholarships and financial aid are available, located on 655 picturesque acres with easy access to the city center, including shopping and dining. It has a vibrant campus life with an act active D2 athlete community. Check out Pitt Johnstown today. Um, Paul, give me a Pirates win total and why. I think uh, uh, Joe Starkey's picks was, was 79 wins. I'm saying 77. Uh, I had uh, Jason Mackey on the uh, baseball podcast yesterday. He says 83. Um, what do you think the win total is, and, and what place in the division do you think it'll be good for? I like 78 wins, and I think that puts them in probably fourth place. Um, I just am not a fan of the pitching staff, Adam. I, I, I like what they've done with their lineup. You know, uh, I think they're going to be better. They're going to hit more home runs. They're going to have more power overall. They're going to score more runs. But I'm sorry, Bailey Falter, Marco Gonzalez. I think Martin Perez is a, you know, okay, whatever. I mean, that's three fifths of your, your rotation. You got Mitch Keller, who, you know, I think we'll, we saw, you know, really, really good Mitch Keller early in the season. And then we saw, not so good late in the season. You know, somewhere in between is where he's at. Every five days, that's what you're running out there to the mound. I guess Luis Ortiz is, is, is you know, or uh, or what's the rookie, uh, Jared Jones. I mean, you know, I, I just don't think that's good enough. Baseball, here's the other thing. Baseball's a long-haul sport. That group of five there, Maybe they get hot a little bit in May or, you know, or in April and May and, you know, they get off to a decent start and they give the Pirates a chance to 162 games is going to expose that group. And I know later in the season they're going to get Paul Skeens and that's going to help. I just don't know that they have enough. And, and I know why people want 83 and 84 wins. I look at their rotation and say that to me is a, is a trouble. It, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's not going to be good enough. How many of those guys are in the rotation at the end, Paul? I think we, we think unless Mitch Kelly gets hurt, you know, he's not going anywhere. But between Gonzalez, Perez, Jones, and Falter, so the other four guys that are <laughs> penciled into this rotation, how many do you think are in that rotation at the end of the year? I would say Keller is the only guarantee. Jones, maybe, if he pitches well. The, I think that I think if Perez or Gonzalez – are either going to be DFA'd because they're not good enough or they're going to be traded at the trade deadline because they're they're worth something. Um, you know, and that may, then then you start bringing guys like Contreras and Priester and you know some of these other guys into the mix. I'm just telling you I I don't think they did a very good job of bolstering their pitching staff and that is ultimately really going to be the problem that they have when it comes down to it uh wins and losses. I just don't think they've got enough. Uh I don't think they have enough in their rotation. I, I agree with you, Paul. I, I told Jason, you know, the Gonzalez and Perez moves were a good start, and then they never built on it. And we, we talked about um, rumored trades all offseason. None of them happened. No. And uh, Jordan Montgomery just went to the uh, what, the Diamondbacks for $25 million for one year. Steve, the, the Pirates love one-year deals, and they just uh, let that dangle uh, and, and put Bailey Falter in the rotation. So – I'm I'm right there with you, Paul. They they did some good things to start, and then just never built on it. And I I don't think that what they have is going to last the year. I think that is primarily because they have not proven an ability to develop pitchers. If Luis Ortiz, if Ronzi Contreras, if Quinn Priester, any of those three guys were in a better place, I think you'd feel a lot better about the situation. But they all stink, for for lack of a better term, <laughs> or, or or at least in in at a starting role, they're not you know credible yeah. threats. Maybe Contreras has success in the bullpen, but that's not helping you you know, with, with the problem you have, which was you don't have any depth five years into a rebuild. It's 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 mind-boggling to let, me. Let, well, let me ask you this, too. The only reason Contreras even made the roster is because he's out of options. Otherwise, it's entirely possible he would have started in Indianapolis. I mean, it, what does that say about him? And we always talk about the development of some of their players. What does that say about what they've done with him? Yeah, no, he'd, he'd probably be uh, he'd probably be gone if they had more depth, Paul. I mean, that's part of it too. Is is there, there shouldn't be room for Rollins and Contreras at this point? Um, alas, I mean, that's that's what they're going to go into the season with. I do want to talk about the offense too, in the context of um, what, what you're saying. This is a 162 game schedule. 
listen, we all know that that O'Neill Cruz can hit these bombs that that end up on Sports Center that get everybody excited. Um, do you believe in his ability to be consistent? Do you believe in Henry Davis's ability to be consistent? Do you believe in Kim Brian Hayes's you know ability to be consistent? Because I think there's a lot of optimism around this lineup because of what those guys can do when they look good. But to me, the problem is, what do they do between those those highlight um, level plays and stuff? Do you believe in them as as consistent big leaguers and not guys that are are kind of flawed, even though that they they can do things that we haven't seen Pirates be able to do for a, a number of years? I think the light went on for Cabrian Hayes in the second half of last season, so I expect him to have a very good season. I expect him to be consistent. You know, I don't know that you know, people I heard yesterday, someone talking about him hitting 25 home runs. I don't see that happening, but, but I think he, he's going to hit well. I think he'll consistently be a good bat for them. Uh, he'll get on base, all that stuff. And of course his glove is glove. So I have no concerns really about Cabrian Hayes. O'Neill Cruz is going to be feast or famine. Let's face it. There's going to be stretches where he looks like you can't get him out, you know, and there's going to be stretches where it looks like he's lost at the plate. Uh, the, the, the hope is that those, you know, the feast or famine, uh, the, those stretches become less and less and less and less, and he becomes more consistent by the end of the year. Um, but I expect him to have a pretty decent year. I think he's going to have good numbers at the end of the year. I, I think it'll be, again, though, it won't be like he's consistent throughout. I think it'll be he's got, you know, he gets off to a great start, then he cools off, then he has another spurt, then he cools off. Uh, and that could be problematic when you're trying to win. You know, we're trying to get to 81 wins if you're – you know, going 25, 30 games and your your big stud is 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 quiet. Paul. Hank Hank Davis to me, I have no idea what we're gonna get out of him. I mean, I want to believe he's gonna be a good hitter. I just don't know. I just don't know. So you you raise a very good point. A lot of the optimism is coming from hey, Cruz is gonna be great and Davis is gonna be great, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's just about doing it every day, Paul. And that's the part that I, I don't necessarily believe in yet. I don't believe it when I see it. It's not that I don't think O'Neill Cruz can be a great player. It's just uh, it's kind of like Ellie Dela Cruz last season in Cincinnati. He 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 wasn't necessarily consistent, even though he was on Sports Center every night. Um, you know, I, I kind of put O'Neill Cruz in, in maybe that same category until he proves otherwise. Paul, I'll get you out of here on this. What's the minimum win threshold that Ben Charrington and Derek Shelton have to hit this season to stay on the job for year six? of this rebuild if it's me or bob nutting uh i guess both if it's me it's got to be more than 81 if you can't get past 81 wins this year guess what you didn't do what you you were supposed to do this is the year you're supposed to at least you don't got to make the playoffs but you better get to 81 wins you know it, if it's if it's nothing I'd, I'd be willing to bet if they go with 75 games again or 76 games again they'll both be back you know, well, we had a little bad luck, this, that. We, uh, You know, young guys grew up, you know. You know what we're going to get from them. And, and so, to me, my standard would be 81 wins. Their standard is probably going to be just do as good as you did last year. Maybe you can prove a game or two, and then we can rationalize why we didn't get to 81 because that's how they operate. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, Paul. Um, but you know, that's that's how you end it. that's how you end up with these 20 year streaks, Paul, is, is giving Ben Sherrington and, and Derek Shelton scholarships for not getting to five hundred for six right. years for five years. I mean, that's that's how I keep making the comparison. A lot of people like to believe we're in 2011, 2012 right now in, in that window. I think we're much more in 2003, 2004, um, when when there was a lot of optimism for a lot of different prospects and they just didn't pan out, the development wasn't there. I, I think that's where we are. I ended up getting people fired way too late. That's how you ended up at 20 losing seasons. 